what we got here is failure to communicate, a chronic neglect of military mental health care. This is Psychiatric Casualties, how and why the military ignores the full cost of war. Welcome, everybody. I'm Mark Russell. I'm Charles Figley. And we're glad that you joined us. This is, I believe, episode six. And then you know, we're still diving into this chapter two of our book, uh, Psychiatric Casualties, where we're really trying to get a, uh, a handle on the scope uh, of these mental health uh, crises and what all kind of goes into a crisis in military mental health care. What would be the topic that you would be most interested in, Mark? I mean, we have spectrum of neuropsychiatric diagnoses, but we kind of covered that. Yeah, I mean, just again, that whole idea that there, it's a lot more than just PTSD, but yeah, something I, I you know, that we had to, didn't discuss, and it's I think <laughs> it's it, it's worth mentioning is what are called cultural idioms of distress. I know you're familiar with that, but for the listeners who may not be, cultural idioms of distress is a, is a jargon type term that really refers to the fact that people of different backgrounds, different ethnicities sometimes, different status, uh, will, uh, there are kind of unwritten rules and what is appropriate to how to express distress and suffering. Uh, and, you know, and, and what is not appropriate to, in, in ways to dis, you know, disclose how we're feeling or what's bothering us. And these are referred to as cultural idioms of distress. They're idioms unique to either a group of people or uh, people of a certain, again, ethnic, racial background or uh, social class or things of that sort. And I think in the military, when I, when I, uh, how I see that kind of manifested is, you know, of course, the military is a social microcosm of broader society. So you get people of all walks of life, different social economic backgrounds, different racial, ethnic, so, sexual identity, et cetera. And the research has shown that some people of certain, you know, ethnic groups, for example, are more prone to express their distress, their stress symptoms, their uneasiness and physical means. And that would be like through headaches or fatigue or sleep difficulties or uh, sometimes irritability um, to gastrointestinal, to all those medically unexplained symptoms we talked about in the previous episode. And I would say that's true in general with the military as well. I think military culture, uh, because there is such stigma about talking about mental health, uh, you know, problems or admitting that we're having some kind of emotional or psychological uh, issue, is that it's easier for us to talk about, I'm tired, I'm not sleeping good, uh, I have headaches, I have chronic pain, uh, you know, I have... Uh, some high blood pressure, something going on cardiovascular wise, right? Uh, you know, you name the organ system, it it's there's a symptom for it, right? And those are things that were many of us are more likely to to disclose or to talk about to a healthcare provider than we are psychological symptoms. Is that something you you come across in your vast years of experience as well, Charles? Oh yes, without right. a doubt, <laughs> a lot of. Them. Uh, a lot of that. Uh, yeah. and interesting, too, because the, 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 there is a the symptom and then it's explained away. Another sentence, oh, well. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they, and the explanations, like for a lot of medically unexplained symptoms are, are conditions like irritable bowel or or GERD or, uh, you know, chronic fatigue or fibromyalgia, uh, yeah, idiopathic seizures. Yeah, things you know just again all of which convey that there's not a real uh there's not a, a, a firm medical or physio physiological etiology a cause but that these are again medically 
generally medically unexplained physical symptoms that are often manifestations of stress. Yeah. Yeah. I had no idea that I had dysidrosis. It's kind of a drying of the, of the hands, etc. Uh -huh. Yes. When I was a kid, um, I would get, um, you know, the, my, uh, I guess the skin is worn down because the little boils in terms of dysidrosis, the, the boils would come out, not that many, it depends, but it was really associated with stress. Yep. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, when I played outside and maybe it was a wet a little bit, it would be do more damage, but I had no idea until um, I was an adult and I had, um, some periods of stress being in the marine corps certainly would be stressful and oh, yeah. uh, discover oh my hands are doing it again but it would go away when in periods in which everything is fine and so that's an example that that's not going to be in any kind of report of any kind of stress that that would be. not at all what it, yeah. it, it and and, it, and, that, and it's so highly prevalent these physical uh unexplained kind of medical symptoms, somatic symptoms. And, you know, the, everyone's heard the term psychosomatic. And in today's vernacular, we kind of look at psychosomatic as conveying something that's illegitimate. Like it's not, it's a pseudo suffering. It's, uh, it's maybe faking, it's exaggerating, right? They're made up, they're fictional illnesses that people have made up because of their psyche or their psychological symptoms. But the origin of the term actually goes back to like 1847. And, and it's, it's to blur the two, uh, it comes out of Greek psychosomatic and it combines the word psyche with somaticos to, to really it was meant and in, intended its origin was the mind and body is being in the, in a, inseparable and interchangeable. So psychosomatic was meant to be not a pejorative of weakness, but it was to state a medical scientific fact that the mind and body are one. And what affects one part of the body, mind, is going to affect the other, right? So there's more of a holistic view. And, and as we talked about in previous episodes, that was the dominant medical legal paradigm of traumatic stress, was that it was psychosomatic it was genuine suffering and you know what was referred to then as traumatic neurosis for example or shell shock earlier on in the first world war but in 1916 as we talked about during the first world war due to the epidemic of uh, people who were leaving the battlefield due to these psychological uh, manifestations of stress uh, led to the outlawing of this holistic view and psychosomatic started becoming more pejorative of it's it's a made up it's a fictional illness similar to what we referred to back then as hysteria there have been a number of concepts similar to that hysteria being an example yeah well it's just it's just something i just throw out there that it, it's mm -hmm. uh, there's a lot we just don't know about the whole mind body connection because we have to science typically kind of reduce the things of the mind and psyche in one discipline and then things of the body and medicine is separate. And so there's this dualism of mind and body that kind of suggests that things of the mind of the psyche are not quite as real or genuine as the suffering from uh, an illness or injury to the body itself. But again, psychosomatic was meant to bridge term that says, look, the thing, illnesses and suffering and injuries of the mind are just as legitimate as to the body. I wish we go back to that time. Yeah, good luck with that. You would think, right? <laughs> um, we can talk about the prevalence of personality disorders. I, I think one of the, yeah. it, it, I, I think this was our uh, effort uh, to find uh, little known uh, facts uh, and share it with you all to um, be able to, we covered everything here as far as we know, but there are numbers of things that we are covering that probably not that many people are aware of. And that's one of the specific reasons why we did this. So grief reactions is an example of that. But traumatic brain injury is another that uh, is 
it certainly for me it, it emerged within my own area of um well now personalities wasn't mark wasn't there an effort to uh, get people out of the military and they called it personality disorders oh that, that that's been going on for uh centuries actually but uh for the military personality disorder or characterological disorders have are determined to be unsuitable for active duty service so if you're diagnosed in the military with a personality disorder chances are high that you're going to be administratively separated due to unsuitability and we refer to that as the backdoor discharge and we're not the only ones the government accountability office has been steep in that as well in holding the the DOD uh, accountable for mislabeling combat veterans as personality disorder and and separating them with sometimes with either general or other than honorable discharges which at that time made them ineligible for VA health care uh, so these would be people men and women who had entered the military with no evidence that they had uh, any kind of uh, psychological problems before they came in, you know, and they enlistment exams were were clean. So they were, you know, went through basic training, went through all their other trainings, and some of them served years, or even decades in the military, and then were deployed and it started exhibiting problems in their behavior, you know, anger uh, that was either given to their officer or senior enlisted, you know, in terms of disrespect, or they would go unauthorized absence. They would start using uh, alcohol or drugs, uh, you know, get into uh, uh, being arrested for different, you know, uh, acts that were uh, as it, that were uncharacteristic of them. But then they would see someone like me and uh, in the military, and they would be labeled as personality disorder. Uh, and then, again, most times separated from service. Uh, and I'm seeing, I still see that. Again, I do the VA disability exams. I'm seeing people diagnose the personality disorder with three combat tours to from Iraq. And, and now they're suddenly they're unsuitable. Yeah, an American. Well, it is, and it's it's an abom. It's a, it's basically, in a way, kind of weaponizing psychiatry. Yes. To how do you get rid of people now who you find to be a pain in the butt, who are acting out, and uh, are not you know are not following the the rules and regulations and and and, and again sometimes you know commanders are in a tight spot right they have to do something for the morale and welfare of the unit etc they can't let people just you know start smoking marijuana again on active duty and not have any consequences but uh, in many cases these people are not given help and they're not identified as having any issues except their behavior their conduct now and uh, and they're separated out unfarly and still are. that's the, the remarkable thing it continues to this day oh it absolutely you know there are there are more there are some rules in place that have because the, these government studies have kind of clamped down on the military's use of these backdoor discharges and we're going to talk more about this in subsequent mm -hmm. episodes but uh so there are there are there are some uh limitations put on commanders that now they have to offer mental health evaluations for people who are going through potential personality disorder uh, or you know kind of unsuitability type evaluations so there there are a little more guardrails but it's still you know we're talking about human beings so that it's not bulletproof or anything mm -hmm. yeah I, I was looking for a there was a quote that I, uh, I'm kind of trying to find. I wish I had had that, but it was coming from the Institutes of Medicine, which is, for those who don't know, the Institutes of Medicine is the kind of medical uh, watchdog for the government, for the U.S. government. And they're the uh, agency that is appointed 
to investigate and research on controversial subjects to help develop policies on healthcare, for example. And they they looked and did an exhaustive uh, study on the effects of stress, protracted stress, and uh, its effects on human beings. And, you know, the whole idea of medically unexplained symptoms that we talked about, or war syndromes or psychosomatic illnesses and that sort of thing. And and I don't see, let me see if I can find that quote, but if not, I'll just kind of give the my, my clip version of it. Now, here we go. So this was their conclusion findings. And this was, I think, published in 2006 by the Institutes of Medicine, quote, Chronic stress can lead to adverse health outcomes that affect multiple body systems, such as the central nervous system, the brain and spinal cord, endocrine, immune, gastrointestinal, and cardiovascular symptoms. And basically, every organ system is affected by this effect of stress. And the more chronic, the more extreme and traumatic the stress, the more profound these physical uh, you know, effects are. So, uh, it, again, it, it, they talk about the Institutes of Medicine, too, that there are structural changes that happen in the body and the, in the brain as a result of these, you know, protracted exposure to stress. So it, it kind of belies this kind of notion that of hysteria or what we now call a psychosomatic of that the issues with the psyche, that stress, psychological problems are are not really real suffering and legitimate like in terms of an injury to the body for example it's easy to, easier to delegitimize it so i you know i taught graduate school for a while after i got out and one of the things i i was teaching on this topic of stress in the body and trauma etc was i used the example of walter b cannon mm. that ring a bell yes sure. right so Walter B. Cannon, uh, it was a American psychiatrist, and he uh, he coined the term fight or flight. That whole fight or flight was from Walter B. Cannon. Well, Walter B. Cannon was an American Army psychiatrist during the First World War, and he went to understand how did good, well-sounded, physically healthy, mentally healthy men and women come in the military, they're exposed to this, you know, protracted stress, traumatic stressors, and how did they break down? Why did they break down? So they led him after it, uh, the First World War ended, led Walter Buchanan to go back to Harvard, I think, and, and study the effects of stress. And one of the ways he went to investigate and came up with fight or flight was he examined what are called voodoo death. You, you know anything about voodoo death? Well, you, you could probably imagine it, you know, in, in some cultures, if a witch doctor or, or somebody cursed you and said, you're going to die, that many times these people would die who were otherwise physically healthy and they would die suddenly. And so, you know, there weren't a lot of examples of voodoo death in, in the United States. So uh, Walter B. Cannon then looked at sudden death experiences in, in America. And you can find, and I show my students all these newspaper clippings of people of good, good physical health, nothing going on physically, psychologically, who would suddenly die either in a roller coaster or they would, something frighten them, such as a movie or, you know, seeing a dog or any kind of a, a very frightening, terrifying experience for somebody. And they suddenly die. And the sudden death is what it's referred to. And what the coroners all conclude was that these people were healthy and they should not have died. But it was the effects of acute, intense stress that stopped their heart. So my question to the students would be like, well, if something could kill you and stop your heart, is that a, a is that a legitimate injury? Is that a is that real, right? And so I think a lot of people, they were kind of skeptical where I was going with that, but they kind of let me, well, that I never thought of it that way, right? That, well, maybe this thing with stress is 
is legitimate and it really can cause stress injuries that are that are as legitimate and profound as physical injuries after all it could kill you yes now that's very profound I, I have nothing to add to that <laughs> yeah I don't know why I just throw that in there I felt I kind of got back into my college teaching days but it's for me it gets just stood up because I I have long languished over the idea that mental health is struggle to find legitimacy like things that were mental or psychological were less meaningful less uh injurious less legitimate than physical medicine and physical injuries and that i think that's a tone that we strike in the book that until we get the mind body uh, dilemma uh until we correctly conclude and go back probably to a more holistic true psychosomatic version of understanding health we're always going to be dividing the things artificially that uh, people with psychological injuries are always going to get the short end of the stick mm -hmm. now, i was thinking that i discovered psychoneuroimmunology as a field yes uh, i thought that was it oh here we go here will be right. the evidence etc and they've gone a long way and, yeah. and certainly the the analysis is there the conceptualization um, but i don't know has it made a difference yeah no i, I know there was efforts in the dod uh, i think of uh, general uh, army general peter uh, corelli who was trying to uh, change the diagnosis from PTSD to PTS, post-traumatic stress. Would be great. Or, or PTS injury. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. and, th and that's a term that you and I use. Yes. Our, our, in our writings about war stress injury or traumatic stress injury. Injury in the sense that it's, again, legitimate as any physical injury that we mm -hmm. experience, and as it should be. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like there was a penetration. There was an assault. Yeah, yeah that very much so. Yeah. Well, right. we talked about traumatic grief. What about we talk about traumatic brain injury? Yeah, well, we, we talked ways. a little bit of, about that. You know, that's it, it. Would really unnerve me when I was kind of going. You know, as they again, as a Navy psychologist on active duty during the whole mental health crisis here was. The DOD and their experts kept coming back to Congress and publishing that, you know, that they call signature injuries of this war in Iraq and Afghanistan were traumatic brain injury and signature in the sense that these were unpredictable. You know, it was all due to this asymmetric guerrilla warfare using input uh, IEDs, right? And that the traumatic brain injuries, again, were not something that we could have predicted uh, and we couldn't have prepared for. And that TBI had become kind of a new modern injury due, you know, to modern guerrilla and asymmetrical warfare. And you know, do you believe that? No, I mean, that's what burned <laughs> me up about it is that you can go back and we go back to the records of Napoleon. And his Surgeon General talked about what I call wind contusions, mm -hmm. which were, you know, a precursor to what in the First World War was called shell shock, right? Which were every bit, or, or you know, we talked about in the 1860s uh, during the uh, trauma pension debates of what we call railway spine or railway brain, and, you know, accidents that were caused during railway accidents due to this violent commotion that shook the brain and called injury to the brain right tbi as we call it today so yeah that it's been you know anytime there's been large blasts or violent commotion like you see in warfare uh there's always been concussive effects and those have always been identified and it was until again this modern approach was like this was unique it snuck up on us we had no way of understanding we needed to start screening for traumatic brain injury until well into the war until congress got involved and the media got involved about traumatic brain injury and now suddenly we 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 view this as a kind of a new phenomenon in the military which is ridiculous sad 
It is. Substance use disorder. Yeah, lots yeah. of it. That's a main. <laughs> that's yeah. A main view. In terms of the dark side of military mental health, the lack of uh, attention to it, the uh, buying beer. I mean, we. <laughs> I remember very well. It was even before Vietnam. It was in Hawaii, at um, Pakaloa, Pakaloa, I think, in uh, the Big Island, and uh, they were passing out beers. Uh, yeah. Okay. Oh <laughs> well, yeah. But I traded those for Cokes because I wasn't into beer yet in that yeah. regard. And it's just sort of amazing. Cigarettes, another example in which it was issued. Here you go. Here's your rations and here's your cigarettes. I mean, it's. Oh, that was the norm, wasn't it? Nuts. it was, nuts. I, mean, I mean, I came in in 79, you know, in, in the Marine Corps. And I remember very vividly out of basic training when I, I got to my first duty station and going to the barracks and I could smell pot. Yeah. everywhere and there's beer cans everywhere I'm thinking again this is post vietnam effects and at that time there was no drug testing uh policy right that came later in the i think later in the seven no the early 80s uh due to uh aircraft accidents and other incidents where people were under the influence right but uh but yeah and in, in today, again, substance use is widely prevalent, obviously not as much the drug use, but still even that, and including prescription drugs. But uh, we treat it as sometimes, often we treat it as separate. Like when people come in for a substance use evaluation in the military, there's not very much discussion or uh, effort to understand why is the person abusing the substances, mm -hmm. right? What are the stressors the things that might be underlying that substance abuse and you know and, and addressing that as well now uh, some of that is done but in large part that's not routine and it ought to be right well there, we talked about this already in numbers of, of sessions but um there's an understaffing acute understaffing and oh. so therefore there's a lot yeah. of a lot of moving around of parts in order to make do and the the semblance of uh, of the full yeah i mean that's there's no question that's a huge problem and that contributes to that you know a lot of these issues about not identifying and and so on but as well as even when you have staffing is that there is inadequate training you know of mental health providers in general, but in the military as well, to really kind of look for, you know, look beyond the symptoms, if you would, and really try to understand the person and, and what's going on, what's the motive and what are some things. And sometimes it's just that they're they're addicted to the substance and it's not necessarily something traumatic or something having to do with their deployments or whatnot. But we ought to be, that ought to be kind of routine, at least when we are evaluating these people that were we're not just addressing the symptoms, we're addressing also the underlying causes too. It's interesting because I've um, <clears throat> certainly in the military, um, you know, I talked about this a little bit in terms of alcohol, substance abuse. Mm -hmm. But th the thing that's, that I've noticed being in the, not in the military necessarily, but in the academy, when you go to try to interview people to, come like we're looking for a new dean now you maybe have a drink some people drink you, you and i go out we have a beer etc cetera, etc cetera. but i've noticed that that's changed a lot oh yeah over time i think that's a good thing frankly and i'll bet you that even if they don't drink at the table they'll go home and drink probably maybe yeah uh, i i know i don't I drink much, much less. I mean, a half oh. a beer at most. Uh, yeah. Splitting, well, wine, split up half a bottle with my wife, for example. But it's, um, yeah, so we're we're more, I think we're more <sighs> monitoring of our own health and our own, you know, what we consume. And, uh, and also our kids, we, we want to make sure that we're a good role model for them. And I think that's worked out pretty well. Yeah, you definitely see a trend where in the military, especially, uh, there used to be NCO clubs or officer clubs on every post, which were watering holes, essentially, right? And those have largely gone away. Uh, 
and you know they still they do have uh, places where you can buy alcohol obviously and but it's a more of a zero defect mentality in the military now so if you have one alcohol um uh, you know issue uh in alcohol related incident that could terminate your career in some respects now when i was in the marine corps i had two duis almost back to back and nothing happened to me at all it was you know i remember i was out in uh, iwakuni japan my first duty station uh with the marines and our commanding officer, a full blood uh, 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 colonel, he'd marched us in formation in civilian uniform out in town, out of the gate of the base onto the Japanese town where there's, you know, a bar town that was outside the gate. And he'd marched us. And then, you know, we, were, we weren't allowed to go back to the base until the, the skipper went back to the base, which he was a raging alcoholic. And so that was, uh, uh, I learned pretty well from him. But for those who did not want to go out drinking with the boys, or you know, in that case, uh, they were punished. They were given the guard duty. They got to watch the flight line. They got to do, do all the things that, you know, none of us want to do, like stand and watch guard for the barracks or something. So, you know, you learn very quickly. You either, you, you, know, you adapt to that. And now that kind of behavior would not be tolerated in today's military and rightly so, but. You know, the military has always had a long um, association, like you said, with tobacco and alcohol. And, and uh, you know, I think you, know, you go back to the American Revolution, the Civil War. I mean, rations of alcohol we use routinely to placate the troops, right? To let them kind of divest or uh, themselves from the trauma of battle. Didn't work very well, but. Well, it didn't end when they left the military either, right? <laughs> Those frogs. Well, that's what I was thinking. Here in Tallahassee, the the main watering hole is the American Legion. And then the VFW yeah. is down the street. And that's, you know, so you go from the military, you go. <laughs> that's right. And the, of course, the, the beer and the wine is less expensive. So. Oh, absolutely. And yeah, again, I, I think that's still true. And like they have like a, uh on base there's usually it's cheaper to buy alcohol and so a lot of us will go to base to buy our groceries including our alcohol and, and that's and that's all fine and, yeah but you know in recently you know again we've treated like a recent phenomenon with opioids pain prescription mm -hmm. right like that was unique to this generation but that problem really hit home during the american civil war mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people became addicted to opium and morphine uh painkillers and uh, alcohol through the american civil war and they left and the war ended and people continued their addictive behaviors and back then they didn't know as much about it right as we do now but uh this whole thing with opioid uh, epidemic and the over prescription of opioid painkillers to treat ptsd as was policy in the va apparently uh you know, again, ignoring those lessons. What do you do when you you give you know veterans you know rampant access to opioids to kill their pain, whether physical or psychological? Is that it doesn't end well. Doesn't end well. Yeah. Doesn't end well. We still haven't spoken about suicide yet. No. Yeah. Well, we haven't, and that's yeah, you know, that's one of those other categories of kind of more of a social behavioral effects uh, of unmet need in military mental health needs is of course suicide that does get a fair amount of public attention as you know yeah the thing that is um odd about suicide in particular is that i think you actually mentioned when you were saying well it's not a it's not a diagnosis but it's you know it's an activity and uh, well, yeah, it's a symptom or it's a behavior or it's a it's a, a manifestation if you would of a for different reasons why people might choose suicide. The only experience I've had with suicide uh, affecting a friend of mine or friends, et cetera, was, um, I, I, I'll not say his name, but he was a corpsman mm. and uh, started a very important uh, organization in, um, <clears throat> for veterans uh, in San Francisco. 
And but he and I and Shad Mishab and everybody uh, were at the White House, and there was a picture of the three of us. And so that was really great. But then Shad told me a couple of years later that he took his life. But I was not surprised at all about that because he was suffering a lot and there were not, he refused to get treatment as far as I could tell, at least as far as I knew. Yeah. Uh, so that was really a major, major loss. Well, I'm sorry, you know, for the loss of your friend. I sense with regard to the military is, is the frustration of the, in a, the failure of getting it and, and, stopping it and changing the dynamic any any new something else uh some program that hasn't been invented yet um needs to happen i mean it's just right there yeah i don't know you know, I, I don't know if there is a new program I mean, the military uh, you know through congress has invested a lot of money and thrown a lot of money at this problem of suicide in the military and the va right yeah. Some some really good things like the crisis lines are available and um, they have uh, military life consultants that are contractors that don't write in records so that people have access in the military to talk to a mental health provider and won't have to worry about it going on their record, that type of stuff. So, and there's been a lot of research, a lot of money thrown at the problems of military suicide, veteran suicide. And one of the things, again, I just get so pissed off when I read researchers and army experts and others who look at the problem with military suicides and they conclude that, well, the suicide rates during wartime are not any different than not in peacetime. And, you know, they're equivalent to the civilian population with exceptions of just a couple of periods where the military rate of suicide seems to be above that of the civilian rate. And, and it just, and I'm talking about Harvard researchers and all these other, you know, people from ivory towers and, and the military, of course, buys it hook, line, and sinker, that there's no real association. The effects of war or, or protracted stress is not the reason why there's a higher suicide rate amongst military and veterans. It's bullshit. That's the thesis these days. Is yeah. Correct? But, you know, we... And we look at this in our in our book and we talk about and I what I did is I went through uh, newspaper records like New York Times, for example. Uh, and I, I found after every war, there is clusters of suicides during and after the wars. And I remember uh, one new this is after the First World War in New York Times. There was one headline that said 400 soldiers commit suicide in New York alone that year. And another uh, headline, I think in 1921 in New York Times was that two suicides a day uh, were being committed by veterans from the First World War. Now that's, that pales in comparison to 22 or 20 a day we see now, right? That's reported, but that's nationwide. This is just one state. That back in back in that time too, when there wasn't a lot of reporting of mental health and suicide in general, but uh, every war uh, there's been a problem with suicides, and it is directly related to experiences not only of being exposed to war stress itself, but just the whole op temple in the military, even those in support roles who are kind of behind the scenes. There's just a lot going on. There's a lot of pressure and stress on everybody and unfortunately the policies of the military are like the issues around stigma in, in particular are what drives these suicide rates high is that that's unmet need and that people are desperate and they do desperate things as i think about it uh those of us who were his friend we were hit pretty hard by that and and I don't know, I think that I've I've worked it through as far as I can tell, although now I'm not so sure <laughs> mm. in terms of the emotionality that, that uh-oh, it's there, uh, not coming out yet, but uh, it's there. Mm. But I, I, during the, the uh, movement uh, to support uh, 
Vietnam veterans, especially combat veterans, et cetera. There, there was a, it was an esprit de corps. We were all in it together. We were, you know, trying to, to push for better services and better understanding, you know, the, the outreach programs, et cetera, worked out eventually. But um, when it hits home, like there was a, you know, a, a friend, a colleague, someone that you knew very well, that mm -hmm. you didn't suspect of having any kind of problems, that happens. It, it really hits, it hit me hard, at least, because I said, what's wrong with you? You have all these degrees, and you weren't able to see <laughs> in a someone who is your friend and mm -hmm. was, uh, that close to suicide. And uh, it, it was... Uh, I think that's what bothered me the most is that I had no idea. And even his close friends, closer friends, because they lived in San Francisco mm -hmm. about that. I want to talk about something else because uh, I <laughs> didn't think I would do this. There was a colleague and friend who died in, in 2013, I think it was somewhere in that, that period of time. He and I worked together on a lot of things, including, you know, papers, et cetera, presentations in particular, but he had a young family. It, uh, it's probably a lot like what uh, your experiences, Mark, young family, uh, beautiful, wonderful wife's great, uh, great sense of humor that he had. And, uh, you know, it was just an attack and or it was a, a carrier for troop, troop carrier, but only like six or eight, but he was an officer and a social worker, and and it it hit me hard. And a colleague of mine, Jeff, uh, called me and and said, um, you know, about uh, Dave's death. It's very interesting because. Um, uh, much of what uh, Dave and I did in terms of our study was sort of figured out in New Orleans. And um, <clears throat> my sense was that I wouldn't be able to function. I mean, I, I didn't say that to myself. I just sensed that, and that it would just screw things up so completely. And, uh, and then knowing how he died in, in terms of you know, not having any chance whatsoever um <clears throat> it brought the war home to me clearly and we were at the i think we were in the second of a five or three year uh grant and uh i had to sort of carry on my own. much of it was data analysis so it wasn't was fine but we were we were out in the field we were you know collecting data from troops. I was interviewing, he was in the back because he was still in the military and didn't want to freak people out. But it was just uh, something that I thought I survived, um, you know, people dying around me. Mm -hmm. And then when he died, <laughs> um, that was pretty bad. And I think in many ways, uh, it changed me fundamentally. I hadn't really thought about that until <laughs> this moment, but um, much more seriously, because he and I would kid around a lot, et cetera, et cetera. And I think much of the, I, I think that was about the time, yeah. did, did I talk about this when we were working together all, on all this stuff? I don't remember. You didn't, I, I think you mentioned something. I know you lost a friend. Uh, I think you mentioned something about it, but I didn't know more about it. Uh, you're okay. Yeah, all right. a lot of this is news to me. Yeah, I, I think that it much of our work together was a carry a carrying on of what um, I they, see. Um, and it was actually much better because we the grant was focusing on studying uh, combat medics, and I, I, he and I both really That's enjoyed right. it. it was going to be you know interesting and fun because there was there was nothing on them. It. it was really weird. Mm -hmm. that's case. And we've also, among other things, found that men and women are very similar in contrast to, you know, all other studies. Mm -hmm. So the male, uh, well, anyway, 
um, men and women see things similarly uh, mm -hmm. cause their uh, medics. So, but anyway, I just, his death was just, you know, it's part of what you have to deal with, I guess, uh, in this kind of work, because we were, you know, I'd say fairly close, I would say. Has, has that happened to you when someone took their life or? Oh, yeah, I was, you know, as you were saying that, I was thinking of my friend who was an army psychologist who had a beautiful young family mm -hmm. and tragically uh, committed suicide and left a note and it was very sad and, and profound about how much we all missed in, in terms of what was going on with them. And we, and I look back and I, I kind of look at it as, and, and maybe we'll get to it today or we get to another episode about just compassion, fatigue or distress, right? Is that I, I could see myself just, I didn't want to know. Uh, I had my own, I went way over my head and, and I, I didn't, I think I recognized the signs were there that he was in real trouble, but I didn't want to open up that can of worms. I just didn't know how to deal with it. I don't know if I could handle it. I didn't know if he could, if I was to probe it, you know, and what's going on. And, and I look back and I just got tremendous guilt for, you know, not having the courage, I guess, to speak to him about it when he was struggling. And, and when there was some evidence that things were, he was not himself. Uh, but, you know, other things that come to my mind is, you know, I, as a military psychologist, I sent many people, hundreds of people, thousands probably back to the front lines who should not have gone back. Mm -hmm. And this kind of goes back to, we talked about the mental health dilemma, you know, that the mission of military medicine is to preserve the fighting force. So as psychologists, military psychologists, mental health providers were trained and indoctrinated that our primary client is the military and our secondary client is the military person or their family members right but the mission is our person primary goal and the whole thing about combat psychiatry frontline psychiatry which we'll talk about in a future episode is that you return back again by policy about 97 percent of people who break down are having some emotional difficulties, you send them back, you know, after a short rest and do some interventions or stuff like that. But so I, I mean, I have so many, I, I feel I have blood on my hands from how many people have I sent back and, uh, and then talking to family members who pleaded to me not to let their service member go back. Uh, but then, them, you know, finding out they were killed or, and then, you know, I'm having and I'll talk to the family members about why we didn't do more to protect their loved one, etc. So it's a lot of what we would call a moral injury uh, is that kind of acting or not acting in ways that go against our deepest values. In this case, uh, my values conflicted with the values of the military and my obligations as a naval officer or military psychologist and that as a human being and so i was as you're talking i'm just resonating with all kinds of things swirling into my pitiful head and and you know we're going to talk about compassion stress later on maybe or something but that it all feeds into that yeah i i think that's one of the reasons why i have focused my energy and attention on caregivers. I mean, the, the last yes. book was on pandemic providers. Yeah. And you wrote the first book on compassion fatigue. Uh, yeah. And you know, it's interesting. A lot of people are not aware of this. Uh, I, I just want to call it secondary traumatic stress. And that's what it is. Uh, yeah. um, but um, the publisher says, you know, Compassion fatigue seems far more interesting and far more compelling and all that. So <laughs> I went with that. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, it was to the publisher already. Yeah. So 
traumatic stress. Well, so, this whole thing with fatigue, right? This, that, uh, I think her name was Carla Johnson in 1992. She coined the term compassion fatigue, and she was an emergency room nurse. No, she wasn't. Let me tell you about oh, that. She's, oh, correct me. She's a reporter. Is that right? How did, yes. how did they get in the what? literature as a nurse? Uh, well, it was a mistake. I mean, maybe I did that, uh, but um, oh. yeah, she definitely is not. Was not a nurse. Spoken to her by phone, and she was a guest on, in my class. So interesting. Yeah, okay. yeah. But you, everything else is correct that you're saying. Yeah. Um, well, maybe. I don't know if this part is correct, but you tell me too. But supposedly, <laughs> Johnson used the term fatigue. Because traumatic secondary traumatic stress or vicarious trauma was not accepted by physicians and nurses as being too stigmatizing and you know perceptions of weakness, et cetera. But fatigue, just like the military did. Remember, mm -hmm. we talked about that transition where they started calling things battle fatigue, combat exhaustion. Uh combat fatigue, fire fatigue, all that was meant to convey the sense that it's universally accepted that most people are going to break down under oh, mm -hmm. at, at, you know, a certain dosage level of traumatic stress, that it's universal. Mm -hmm. So it's to normalize that people are going to have some reaction to exposure to stress, but it's short-lived, right? Anything longer than six months would have been viewed as either malingering or personality disorder or it's a sales job. Well, yeah. I mean, it, it, how can we package this in a way that will be more appealing or at least won't turn people off initially? Right. And again, the intention initial it may be right. Okay, look, so it's not as stigmatizing. People at least will accept fatigue mm. uh, and will acknowledge they're tired and they would, might do something to get be more open to get help for that than they would if you tell them it's secondary traumatization or like, and that's what's happening as it turns out i i monitor the literature daily yeah and uh, uh the, it is evolved uh from military and from um emergency workers mm -hmm. to nurses uh who work in all everywhere in the world in all specialties it's mm -hmm. really remarkable and that then has it's now um made it into schools and, and studying how teachers have become you know fatigued or whatever we call it um, right the, the work etc but there's there has been i think i mentioned this already there has been a, a a major shift in how compassion fatigue or at least secondary trauma or any kind of, of the focus is on the practitioner the focus is on you know those that are providing assistance, trying to heal people. Right. Um, I, I'm very happy about that. But at the same time, I have, <laughs> I'm co-editing a book on compassion fatigue. It started out, but my colleague, one of my colleagues, um, a former student actually, Brian Bride, he suggested it should be compassion fatigue. I'm, I'm sorry, secondary trauma. Uh. Because uh, that's, and I agree with him. I understand that. Yeah, that's right. It's going so well. It's moving. It's taking off in terms of compassion to themselves. Yeah, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen George Carlin's uh, skit on PTSD. No. I'll send it to you. It's hilarious. <laughs> but of course, he's such a master of of language, right? Yes. And communicating. But yeah, uh, I won't, won't still, but go ahead. The seven things you can't say on television or something like that. Yeah, that's that's another skit, right? <laughs> but uh, but you know, he was very um, very humorous, but really making a great point that we used to have direct language to really talk directly about what the issues was. And he was talking about the example of PTSD and you know shell shock uh, would is very direct. It's very clear <laughs> what's causing the injury, and it's two words, and you know it's and then he goes into you know other examples and it ends up with post-traumatic stress disorder you know in this very sterile four words now or something and 
but it, you know it was very comical but really hit to the point like you know con compassion fatigue or battle fatigue or combat exhaustion may be destigmatizing in some ways but it also actually does reinforce stigma in other ways mm -hmm. those of us who are having more than fatigue mm -hmm. you know more and aren't recovering quickly and mm -hmm. you know, after a bit of respite what does it mean about us yeah Right, and, yeah. and we continue to have some reactions and distress, etc. Um, yeah. But yeah, can't argue with you. Can't argue, huh? <laughs> but that, did I ever share with you my um, my bout with compassion fatigue? No. All right. Well, I'll I'll, I'll give the short version of, it and we can talk uh, more on a future okay. episode about it. But uh. This was in the height of my being uh, a military whistleblower and also the only mental health provider on a Marine base of 6,000. 6,000 clients. Clients. And then I'm covering two other bases on top of it. So I'm on a pager and a cell phone getting calls all times a day and night. Impossible. Right? Oh. Crazy, right? Yeah. And I was laying a... I was talking to my wife on, and we were living out in town in Japan, in rural Japan, and we had a Japanese house. And I'm laying out there and talking to her and about the day's events. And suddenly, I stopped talking, and I suddenly am not responsive anymore. And I'm looking straight ahead. I I'm aware. I'm conscious. I cannot move. Wow. I'm paralyzed. I am mute. I cannot speak. I can hear what's going on. My vision became very black and tunnel, but I could still see. But the sounds, like my sounds of my wife, my kids crying, it was like being underwater. It was muffled. So I'm getting some perceptions, but not that. And I'm thinking to myself, oh, I'm I'm having a stroke. Yeah. I, I'm, I might be gone. This might be it. And a part of me is saying, thank God. <laughs> oh man right oh I mean, I'm, just to be honest and then i hear my children crying my wife and i'm thinking okay no nah, this isn't the time to go the japanese emts are called they come into my house and they lift me onto a gurney and again i'm immobilized right i go to the er and i'm getting cat scans mris ekgs eegs all that other stuff and they can't find a single thing wrong with me, right? Medically unexplained. They diagnose it as idiopathic seizure, mm. which means they don't know what it is, right? It's mm. unexplained. Yeah. So that was my first real understanding that psychosomatic is real. <laughs> Hysteria is real. You can call it whatever you want. Right. Uh, medically unexplained whatever but it felt every bit real i was motivated to get up and speak i did not choose that i wasn't trying to get out of combat i wasn't trying to get you know malinger for a pension i was no pension neurosis it was me succumbing to the effects of chronic stress and i was exhibiting these medically unexplained psychosomatic symptoms right but it was it was really uh, the compassion stress from all the things that I've seen and heard, all the stories that we all do, that led to my friend uh, Peter's suicide as an army psychologist. He could not take it anymore; didn't wasn't able to process it any way meaningful. And so that, for me, made compassion fatigue. I get irritated with that term because <laughs> I was not just tired. I was injured. Yeah. There was something in my brain that changed that, that switch flipped off. And if well, that is that, if it can affect you that real in that way, uh, it's more than just fatigue. Speaking of that, what happened after that? I mean, did you slowly recover? I did. I, I recovered fairly quick as far as my capacity to speak and move. It took about, I don't know, five or six hours in the ICU, and then I recovered my functions, right? 
Wow. And I wasn't allowed to drive for three months. And, you know, I had to go through a whole post neurological and medical mm -hmm. workups and they couldn't find anything again to explain it. Uh, other than the fact that I had lost probably 50, 60 pounds in the four years I was there under that stress. And I'll share with you a photo later on that would show you a skeleton of sure. a person that is yeah. weights. Oh, I was, I had no weightlifting. I wasn't sleeping. Obviously I wasn't eating. I mean, there was, it wasn't a mystery to me why I succumbed the way I did, but it was the fact, the protracted chronic stress that was literally killing me. And I allowed it in a way and welcomed it in some ways. Yes. May have saved your life. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, in a way, it did wake me up, and then it caused me to pull back, and and uh, I had to cut down a lot of what my clinical hours because I was working six days a week in the clinic. You know, seven a.m. to seven p.m. were my hours, and then I'm on pager watch, right? So that that didn't change. Being the only credentialed mental health provider for that base, so. and two others. Yeah, I did too. Uh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. But that's why, again, I think compassion is interesting. You look at caretakers, and there's millions of them, of, of wounded warriors who now become professional caretakers and had to be uh, for their, their wounded son, daughters, husband, wives, fathers. You know, if our podcast uh, does it, nothing but educate people about this in particular uh, yeah great service i think i hope so i hope by learning our lessons things that we've done well but also more importantly our mistakes and mm -hmm. and that uh you know that it, it opens the door for people to consider that you know their situation's not a lot different and you know we're we're two mental health professionals supposedly and yet we both talked about in these last two episodes our vulnerabilities and our humanity. And I know we're just scratching the surface on that, but uh, more to come, I guess. There will be, yes. And I'm, I'm glad we are. And we have the uh, wherewithal to talk about it and to move on whenever we're needed, if we need to. Yeah. It was a good session. Okay. Well, I see that we're kind of at our time for the episode. So we thank everybody who listened to this. And then again, if you wish to contact Charles or myself, uh, please email me at mrussellphd at gmail.com and we'll get to your uh, your comments and uh, any uh, anything else that comes up in, in future shows. Great. See you later. 